He's heard that um, the suggestion that we start off by singing O Canada. And I am not a, um, a very good singer, so if anybody would like to leave. Um, Karen's point was that we are proposing new words. Um, Merle Delanger um, has uh, proposed a change, and that's a different discussion. I'm more than happy to stay around afterwards if anybody has any thoughts on that. Um, we are at, um, uh, it hasn't been uh, completed yet, um, but uh, it, there is a proposal to change an all thy sons command to an all of us command. Um, but uh, if everybody would um, care to join us, uh, maybe um, Karen and anybody else with a good voice, um, we'll just take a minute and uh, start off by the singing of O Canada. So um, I have about an hour to an hour and a half today to set aside, but we'll try to keep the discussion within an hour, and uh, and hopefully that meets with everybody's schedule. And uh, if we need a bit more time, then we can uh, take it. Um, my hope is to be wound up no later than four. Um, but uh, if there's a really good discussion, I'm not going to cut us off, so we'll just kind of see how it goes today. Um, so to begin with, I'll just um, flip through the. Um, I'm my glasses on, so we'll see if I can get the right minutes. sound. Very um, so the uh, defense policy, as I said, this is really to look at, um, we're trying to capture what our defense priorities and objectives should be, and we'll, we'll get into a bit of that. Um, we want to figure out you know, what role the uh, armed forces should play domestically, um, across North America, and then internationally. And, um, and it's that balance of, um, of roles that we've historically played. Um, we try to get a sense of do we have the right balance? Should we be refining things? Are there new areas that we should be looking at? And as I was reading the material, there were a couple of really interesting things that will come out in the, uh, the discussion today. Um, one of them being that, um, I think, think it said above the 65th parallel, that there's no satellite coverage um, for our armed forces. And yet, um, one of the things that we have to rely on the, um, the uh, armed forces to do is to play um, a really strong role maintaining our presence in Canada's north. And as we have climate change and, and <clears throat> more traffic and more interest um, in the high Arctic. Um, the question is, well, you know, should we actually be uh, investing in space technology? Um, there's things like unmanned, uh, unstaffed um, drones and things like that that we haven't relied on very much previously, and should we be investing in that kind of technology? And so those are the types of questions that will come out in, as we go through the presentation today. Um, we're um, looking at some um, you know, just uh, figuring, as I said, um, trying to figure out what, what task, what roles we want uh, the armed forces to play. Um, what are the pure current capabilities? You know, where there's been lots of discussion recently about the replacement of our fighter jets. Um, what's the right decision there? How much as Canadians are we willing to invest in the modernization of our, uh, of our Air Force? Um, we've, the previous government had uh, committed to um, redoing the naval fleet, and our government is keeping that uh, commitment, and so there's um, shipbuilding contracts are being invested, but it all costs money, and um, and so you know that's things I'd like you to think about as we get into the uh, the discussion. Um, you know the, this whole idea of investment decisions and planning, where do we want to go into the future, um, uh, geographic focus, regional priorities, where do we want uh, the uh, the forces um, to be uh, based out of, um, and uh, yeah, the the issue of. Um, uh, what kind of relationship we want with our allies um, internationally, and uh, should we be relying on them? Should we be playing a leadership role, a support role? So th these are the types of things that we're really trying to uh, capture. So we go through a really uh, brief uh, um, history here. Just uh, you know, we've, our um, forces, reserve force, created in 1855. So we had 
reserves for a long, long time. Uh, regular force, 1871, Navy created in 1910, Air Force 1924, and then National Defense created in 1923. So we have this legacy of, um, of history in, in, um, in the military and uh, you know, needs have changed and Canadians' priorities have changed. And so this is really trying to say, okay, in 2016 and moving forward for the next 10, 20, 30 years, where should we be focusing? And so that's, uh, again, the, the, the time frame we'll be looking at is you know, in the, the me short, medium, and then long term. So keep that in your mind as we uh, continue on. Um, many of you probably know this, um, but uh, 68,000 regular force members, 28,500 uh, reserve force members, uh, 100 different career fields. And then there's also the, the civil servants, the non-uniformed um, uh, men and women uh, in the Department of National Defense who support the Canadian Armed Forces. And so it's a, it's a very um, large uh, group that we have working for us um, on our uh, defense uh, issues in the country. Uh, go to the next one. And then, yeah, on the, um, the civilian side, 24,000 um, different positions. So it, it's a large number of employees that are supporting uh, defense. And um, on the uh, uniform or the non-uniform side, we have the administration, policy development, procurement, uh, finance, public affairs, science, those types of things. Um, three environments, we have the Canadian Army, Royal Canadian Navy, Royal Canadian Air Force. And, uh, and then the uh, different uh, command structures that we have in place, so four different commands. Um, and, and as I mentioned, uh, as I was uh, getting started, that we really have three areas. So one is the, the idea of protecting Canada. One is protecting North America, or defending North America through NORAD. And, uh, and then looking at international peace and security. And uh, again, it's like trying to figure out um, what it is that we want to be doing. Uh, if, if any of these are more important than the others, or um, you know exactly what we uh, where we should be like should we be focusing domestically, um, North America, internationally. So within the Defending Canada piece, um, not only are we involved in uh, the the kind of um, active uh, defense, but uh, things like coastal patrol. We have the Coast Guard, but um, in many cases when there are um, search and rescue initiatives that we have. Um, the uh, the um, Canadian Armed Forces, uh, particularly with the air capacity, are often called in to help with um, with um, those kind of search and rescue efforts. And um, so one of the things we need to look at is, is that an appropriate role for our defense dollars to be used for? And, um, and, and there will be a chance for me. To, I will stop talking soon and give, turn the floor over to everybody here. Um, looking at um, you know, monitoring skies, so if there are um, issues um, related to um, uh, possible penetration by uh, alien enemies, um, um, you know, what would the role be for the armed forces to try to um, uh, defend our skies? Um, we saw a bit of, um, well, yeah, so that, that's a question what role they should play. Um, the Arctic, as I said, growing interest in the high Arctic um, from uh, um, our resources from just um, opening it up um, because of um, uh, climate change that we're going to have probably more tanker traffic and, and other traffic and uh, so is there a role for the armed forces to play um, related to that? Um, search and rescue, helping with uh, disaster relief, we've had floods and fires and um, the armed forces will often be uh, called in to help out um, to lend uh, additional support for those types of things so is that an appropriate use of, uh, of resources? Uh, is that something we as Canadians want to see continue? And, uh, and then international events, things like the G7 uh, conferences or summits that have happened. And uh, there's another one coming up in a couple of years. And so um, the uh, armed forces are involved in security and as we have international leaders come to the country. Uh, so those are some of the things we do at home. And uh, so um, things to consider are the threats that aren't being addressed adequately than anybody lays in bed at night worrying about thinking who's looking after this, that or the other thing on our behalf as Canadians? Um, are there regions or issues that we should be more concerned about than others? You know, is the high Arctic a higher priority than the south? Are the coastal areas more important than the interiors? Um, you know, those are, are some of the things that uh, we're, we're trying to get some uh, answers to. And then um, this idea of domestic forces, or uh, Canadian forces, what should they play, uh, role, uh, what role should they play domestically? Um, and should they support civilian authorities, municipalities in the, issue, in the case of disaster um, relief and things like that? 
Um, North America, as I said, um, we're involved with the Americans uh, to defend North American space, um, essentially the continent. And uh, so it's with the North American Aerospace Defense Command, or NORAD. And um, uh, that, that's a long standing agreement with the Americans. And, uh, um, you know, is that something that we feel is still important? Uh, should we play a support role to the Americans? Uh, you know, so those are the, the types of questions related to North American defense. And then internationally, um, you know, something that we've heard uh, Canadians have really um, uh, prided themselves over the years about the, the role that we played as peacekeepers internationally. And, uh, you know, is that an appropriate role? Do we feel that we're making the, the right inroads into international security issues? Um, should we be um, dealing in a, a more um, active role um, in engaging with um, foreign uh, enemies? Um, or should we be playing a, a, a more of a, a support role, training other others in uh, in defense? Um, and um, you know, should we be playing a role in uh, preventing conflict before it occurs? So getting in there um, to areas that are, are simmering and uh, perhaps playing um, some sort of role. You know, how, how interventionist do we want to be? And that's a question that we have. Um, so yeah, we, we do the international peace and security in a number of ways. There's actual combat operations, uh, regional security operations, uh, peace support and stabilization, um, the idea of training and um, advisory operations, humanitarian operations, um, helping uh, people get out of conflict zones. Um, and uh, the Canadian Armed Forces have also helped in uh, issues, you know, earthquakes and floods and things like that, um, helping um, uh, foreign uh, civilians who are, um, are, are living in desperate conditions actually move and, and in many cases become refugees to Canada. Um, and then just, um, you know, how do we prepare for the future? So what we have, is that the right bag of, of, um, of skills and, uh, and equipment or, or do we need to be looking in different ways? So we're looking, you know, um, security, international security has become very unpredictable and how, how do we anticipate where those hot spots might be and how do we actually engage with those? Um, so, you know, this idea of agility, how, do we, uh, how are we nimble in our responses to emerging international situations? Um, should the size, structure, and composition change? Do we have the right mix of, with the Air Force, Navy, and, um, and uh, the ground forces um, with the, uh, through the Army, or do we need something different? Um, the uh, supporting health and wellness of uh, our uniformed uh, men and women and their families. Um, you know, are, are we investing appropriately in those who are serving our country? Um, should we, um, are there niche areas that we should be looking at developing um, expertise in and letting somebody else carry the load in, in different areas? And then um, the, the idea of investments in space, as I said, um, in uh, kind of the cyber world and unmanned systems. And then this is a, an area that gives an idea of the 15 international areas that we're currently involved with. And so is that something as Canadians that we still feel are important? Or, um, you know, the idea of, you know, do we look after at home, North America, or go abroad? So that's um, really, yeah, how we uh, set the stage. Um, for this. Does anybody have any questions in the preamble? And otherwise, we'll just kind of jump into it with some questions. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Start with all good. I'm surprised having been, had our company built the whole telecommunication system across the north, including those stations. I'm surprised at the outset when you said that there is no communication with the far north. Yeah, I was surprised too. It was uh, this um, document is online, and I can give you the website. Um, it's a, a public consultation document, and that it was in this document that it talked about that. And afterwards, I can actually find it, but I, I just I had no idea. What's that? She couldn't hear what I said. Oh, um, she, she was just saying that she was surprised uh, my comment about not having some of the satellite coverage, telecommunications coverage, north of the 65th person. Um, um, uh, um, just, just surprised by that. No, saying this was the uh, the source for that information, which is our, our company. Where did that book come from? Our company. Uh, it's online. Yeah. Yeah. Built the whole but the you print the copy. Only limited supplies. I'm not. I can find those. And I'm surprised to hear that. Uh, well, I did download. Yeah. That the 
So let me get my uh, list of questions here, and, uh, and then we'll just stop. Um, I think we better send it out for tender, pal. <laughs> like we didn't do for the hornet. So, and, and um, just one second, um, Shirley is going to uh, take notes, and uh, we have until um, late July to actually gather comments from Canadians. So this is, like I say, just a very first step. And uh, if you do have thoughts um, that you that we don't capture today, you can still go online and send those in. Uh, tomorrow, Leon Jensen, um, who ran in Langley Aldergrove for the Liberal Party and wasn't um, elected, but uh, he's in the reserves and, and has served uh, with the reserves. He's doing one of these sessions at the Langley Event Center on 200th Street. And so if anybody's interested in joining, he's actually set it up as a whole day event and he has um, lots of things going on. So um, if anybody's interested in that, we can get you details on that as well. Sorry, sir, you had a question. Uh, just in regards to the satellite print, print over the north, um, essentially from the very tip of Ellesmere Island, we don't have it in the first 650 kilometers. After that, then we have satellite. And really, the only station up there is CFS Alert. So, of course, with the, you know, the, the water lines opening up, that's one thing. But as far as military assets, they have a microwave link down 650 kilometers. So there's really not a big communications gap as far as safety and security. Okay, good. Thanks for clarifying that. Uh, Anybody have any other questions or I'll just jump in and what I'll do is, is throw out a couple of questions at a time and we'll just, uh, anybody who has any thoughts, um, we'll do it, we'll ask you not to speak for too long just so everybody can get a chance and we'll try and move through this. Um, Maybe everybody could try to speak up as well and just repeat any questions. Okay, yeah, I'll, so I'll, I'll try to do that as well yep. so we can hear. Um, so are there, um, the first one relates to just the, the general security environment that we're operating in. And do you feel that there are any new areas, security areas, that are not being addressed adequately or regions that we're more concerned with than others? So anybody have any thoughts on those, like as far as new or emerging areas related to security threats um, that you feel as a government that we need to respond to that we may not be positioned to, uh, to respond to at this time? The Americans that are going to flood over here if Trump wins. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see that as a security risk? That's a threat? real security risk. I think so. Okay. And our water. Sure. Um, so I think the assumption about the ability of our allies to help us, um, I mean, there seems to be a lot of geopolitical sort of turmoil and internal challenges in Europe. Um, they've got the Brexit thing going, and they've got challenges. Uh, the U.S. has you know, interesting politics. So, so I think uh, sort of positioning uh, ourselves as sort of, uh, in addition to uh, the country, I think we still need a strong basic level of uh, capabilities to support the defense. Sort of the support? Uh, our defense needs. Okay. And, and, and all about this semester? It's in natural defense. Okay. And Shirley, are you getting it? Yeah. You're okay. All right. Anybody else have any thoughts on this idea of security? Or, sir? Uh, Everybody, so I brought my sign in here. Just make sure when you come up, just take a look at it. Okay. This is the campaign from last year. Since your government is liberal now, I'm sorry, but I will support it. But I, I, my predictions were still in the NDP, but I'm NDP, but I'm not NDP per, uh, card carry member. I may be, I'm not sure. I'm an independent voter, always yeah. independent. But we, we, in our kind of system, we don't exclude anybody. As, uh, you don't have to be a card carrier on the yeah. participating party. Uh, I appreciate this. I'll have a look before yeah, I leave today. Yeah, thank you. And so everybody can look at it. Okay, perfect. Whether you disagree or not. Agree. And yeah, you know, that's uh, perfect. It doesn't matter who you vote for, what your um, supports are. We're, we want to talk to everybody and hear from everyone. So. I, um, my, my question okay. is just pick one area. Sure. Since we have the Donald Trump in down the south, and being Donald Trump possible, maybe possible, maybe a new president, maybe not, but still don't know yet. So when he's gonna be, he will say, we are been cramping on too, too long on their shoulder, and we have to be picked up on ourselves. We can't always rely on somebody else doing our dirty works. We have to more emphasize on our soldiers, particular the mental peace. We have more, I'm worried about the veterans. 
that's the other issue. The veteran affairs should be treating our veterans pretty badly, on maybe mostly ca other case by case cases. But by majority, is 20 percent are treated badly. We are disposal. We we our mentality is disposing these people after they go into the war. That's not right. No, absolutely, and that's one of the things we will get to. Yeah. And, and what I'm hearing is that we need to treat our veterans respectfully. Absolutely. And one thing. Uh, uh, you know, I, I do one thing, and then we're, you, you've had one chance. Uh, but we're going to try and move it around. Hey, I'll come back to you. Come back. Um, was it somebody over here? Did you have? No. Okay. Um, one minute. I think that my biggest concern is probably the escalation uh, in Eastern Europe and, and Russia being, you know, more ordinary as the year goes on, right? Um, escalating forces in you know, uh, NATO, you know, throughout Europe, uh, you know, they're building up a defense along the Russian lines, right? And personally, I, I think it's, you know, it's escalating towards a new sort of Cold War situation. But frankly, I, I think it's very scary. So. And, and, and so what, what do you feel Role, what role should Canada be playing as we see that happening? And uh, you know, um, Eastern Europe is one example. What's going on in the Middle East uh, is another, where we get this you know, the potential for some global instability. And, and so, you know, the question is, what should we be uh, making that our business, or do we wait until something happens before we uh, we wait in? Well, to be frank, I think you know things have already happened. I mean, you look in the, the east of Ukraine. Right. I mean, that didn't just happen overnight. Crimea didn't happen overnight, but you know the world stage has really not done a lot of direct action, you know, beyond some financial sanctions and, and so forth. And I think that you know we need to, to work with them in a positive nature to, to de-escalate that situation before it turns into what happened 30 years ago. Does anybody have any thoughts on that? In general agreement? With, um, yeah. uh, you know, I I refuse to be scared because you know in. In the United States, every day, 99 people are shot. 99 people a day. And to me, that's a civil war that's going on below us. And we have no control over that. What I suggest is, um, since the Liberal government wisely chose to rename some of its departments, perhaps the Department of Defense could more aptly be named it the Department of Defense, Peace, and prosperity, and that speaks to the procurement, uh, the issue of procurement since Canada has undertaken bombing missions over Libya, Egypt, and Syria in an effort to contain ISIS. I subscribe to the notion that ISIS has its roots in climate change, poverty, and hopelessness, matters that no bombing raid can resolve. Our Liberal government, rightly to my mind, has ceased bombing missions in favor of training locals whose mission in life is not to kill, but to resume a peaceful life where they can prosper, recognizing the fragility of the planet and the collective need to find workable solutions to the problems facing mankind. I don't think that going out and buying and having a big argument about um, fighter jets is what we should have top, at my, top of mind in our national defense. I, I think we should bring a peace component back into our thinking. So that sounds like a good piece to get some uh, thoughts on. So, uh, I would touch on that. Is I would strongly say against this whole concept of that we need to go back to the peacekeeping operations. I've served with Canadian Armed Forces. I've seen a lot of the stuff that we have done. I have worked with Afghani civilians, and even them stating that they loved having us there and they didn't want us to leave because they knew what would happen. It's not a fear that we have built into our communities. It's not a fear like the way the states are. It's called being prepared for something that could happen. So rebuilding the military is a good thing. We need to upgrade. We need these new things. We're sitting there driving around vehicles from the late 70s, early 80s to this day that we can't use in a combat role or for any defense in any way, shape, or form. We need these new planes. We need these new naval carriers. We don't even have a sub that's in working order. Like, we need all this equipment to be able to support this the second largest country in the world. And we don't have the equipment to be able to supply. It's bad enough when you're in the service, you can't get a uniform that fits you because they don't have that size. That is what we need to be complaining about. Instead of the peace offerings of saying that we need to bend over backwards for everybody. It's, we need to build up ourselves 
as a country. So if I can paraphrase what I'm yeah. hearing is that whatever it is we decide to do, let's make sure that we're properly resourced, we have the right equipment and, uh, and, and uniforms that to, to uh, engage appropriately. Yeah. <coughs> hey, good comment, yeah, absolutely. So, sorry, just to sort of build on some of the comments, um, I was doing some reading and it looks like Canada over the last decade has been under investing in our military and falling significantly short of our NATO commitments. Uh, and sort of you know, looking at some numbers, I looked online, there's some websites, you can see how Canada's military ranks on key things like jets, ships, uh, our forces personnel. And a lot of these were like 40th, 50th, 60th uh, in terms of resources. And I think at the point that something happens, it's too late. So, so I think that we've got a great opportunity to, to rebuild and to do things right. Uh, I'm really happy that we've got this engagement process in. Um, and I think that we, we need to decouple having that level of preparation from uh, you know, sort of getting involved in specific conflicts. I think having a larger military that's adequately staffed, not excessive, um, I think that gives us more influence in the world, whether we're advocating for peace, whether there's an Ebola crisis or tsunami that we want to respond to, I think uh, having more resources gives us choices and empowers our government to have more influence in the world. I also think as taxpayers and citizens, I feel like we're doing a disservice to the people who have been in the military and have stepped forward to, to represent our country and safeguard our country and the world uh, by not giving them the resources. I've talked to people who have quit the Navy because they can't get on a ship. And not things like that. It seems like you know we, we have some serious work to do. Okay. Great, great feedback. Um, there is uh, sec well, uh, did you have a comment? I did. Okay, yes. let's see. Uh, there's a growing long-term political, geopolitical uh, situation involving obviously all of the countries of, uh, of the north with the uh, division of or the the attempt to set up borders between different countries. And, Certainly the uh, major players are looking at it from a resource availability standpoint. And the, uh, the Russians are building substantial military capabilities in the north because they realize that there is a uh, potential strategic advantage to be gained by having that sometime in the future when those decisions are being made. So putting some of it on the regional basis, the north is uh, an area of I'd like to know when we're going to commit our 2% of the budget to the military instead of letting our American brothers carry the can for us all the time. Okay, and, and just on that, um, you know, great points again in the material I was reading. It notes that Canada right now is investing about 1% of our gross domestic product in um, our armed forces, and the, uh, the international recommendation is 2%. And so it means to meet that commitment, essentially doubling the amount of resources going into it. So we'd be um, you know, closer to the $35 billion um, as opposed to uh, where we're at now in this 16, 17, uh, and, and then you know, if you add in um, some of the uh, ship and, uh, and aircraft uh, reinvestment, you know, it would be above that. But we, we are below the international standard. Um, so you know, we, yeah, that's a, a great point that we're not there. And, and as Canadians, so, it would be uh, useful to hear, you know, should we be going as far as doubling that investment? Is Are these services that important to us as Canadians? Uh, Jim. Uh, I was reading in the Vancouver Sun a couple of months ago, and uh, I forget the journal's name, but he was comparing our situation with our Commonwealth uh, brothers and sisters down in Australia. And he felt that the approach that the Australians used was quite a bipartisan approach. Uh, I feel that, uh, you know, you know I'm a liberal, but uh, uh, there will be times when we're not in government and somebody else will be in government, will they bring another plan in? And I think if we need to modernize our armed forces, it has to be a continual procedure. It has to be everybody on board, whether you're conservative, uh, NDP, or liberal. It has to be for the long term and the big picture. And I think that's really what's missing in this country. If you go back to uh, 
uh, Prime Minister Ketchian's decision to ax the um, Mulroney helicopter program. Uh, that was a sin, I think, that we Liberals committed, and that forced that project to the back. That was a pro that was a partisan issue, and I think we should de or, or bring in a more bipartisan approach to our defense for the long term. That's right. That's what I'm going to say. The appropriation of, or, or what to call, uh, defense acquisition process have to be informed. Have to be informed. We've been dedicated our money. We don't know where the money go. And then just the department decision, make a decision on the F-35 instead of switching now as F-18. Now, let's do a proper open tender. All the all the contract above fifty thousand dollars should be in contract on open tender, okay. yeah. not, not yeah. just particular one issue. Yeah. You can't get these people. Get the people who serve. Fill out the question. They know they were the front line. They need the beep, the equipment to protect themselves. Okay. Yeah. They they should be a first priority, and then our second is the public priority. Two stage people question. Okay. Five years shouldn't be. Every five years should have one of these. Okay. Sir, the, point, yes. the yeah. point is is that we sent our troops, including my grandson, into combat without any backup helicopters. Yeah, that's right. For medical, that's right. Uh, without for med an adequate so, support so, equipment. So your point is is not that we sent them there. We sent them yeah. there when they were ill-equipped. So it is Because, so that's why the acquisition so cost very, yeah, very antiquated. Well, there should be a slim pole, open, yeah. like two-step yeah. system. Instead of you have yeah, no, I, I got uh, message now. Department of Public here. Works, yeah. maybe so, and which is where we have national defense doing procurement and the open transparency. Instead, should be the Department yeah. of Defense all priority open tender got and it. civilian. John, We've got it. Got it. Yeah, I was going to say over here we go, and then I'm going to move on to the next uh, round of questions. So, um, similarly to uh, what several people have expressed, you know, uh, I fly a lot. I probably fly once, twice a month anyway. Uh, out of all my time flying, I've had three emergency landings. Every time was in a hurricane. So, <laughs> you know, that sort of speaks to the, the, the quality of the equipment that we're using. And I certainly feel that, you know, the passing from one government to another is certainly a big detriment to the procurement process. And I think that we really need to protect the lives of our service members because they're giving it up for us. Yeah, absolutely. Just on the, um, the, the kind of partisan issue that was raised, um, my understanding, and I, I can confirm, but my understanding is that every member of parliament, all 338 of us, have been asked to participate in this process. Actually, 336 right now, but um, um, it, so we're, we're trying to make it inclusive of all parties uh, and, and getting everybody there so we're not consulting with liberal supporters, we're consulting with Canadians. And uh, so to me, that's a way of trying to build a plan to carry us forward that represents the needs of Canadians, not any particular party. And uh, you know, that's uh, a commitment that I, I bring to uh, this round. What I'm going to do is move into um, a, a bit of a discussion now on the domestic piece. And so a couple of questions I have here, um, if we could just kick this around a little bit. So domestically, what role should the Canadian Armed Forces play, including support of civilian authorities? Um, well, let's start with that one. So you know, things like supporting the Coast Guard in search and rescue or helping um, in, in cases of disaster response uh, domestically, are those appropriate uses for our armed forces? It, you know, show of hands, um, all in favor of, you know, yes. Do you think that that's an appropriate use? Um, and anybody opposed to that or thinks that, you know, maybe we should not be uh, doing that? Anybody feel strongly against that? This is just sort of a straw test. To, okay, so um, a sense that, that um, when we get into these extraordinary crises, um, having uh, provincial, municipal governments being able to call the armed forces and say, we're in a bind here, can you send in some help? We're, we're generally in agreement with having that kind of capability. Well, would we rather have our soldiers in to northern Alberta than the uh, African firefighters that, that are up there now? I mean, why are we, why are we mixing the two? turns over to it being their summer. We are sending Canadian firefighters to assist the Australians. It's building the friendship between 
the Allied Forces. Now going on with doing domestic operations inside of Canada for the military, it's good, the only issue is, is that the military is highly expensive to provide. That's the only concern is that if we can bring that down, we can start using more for domestic operations with the wildfires because the government doesn't want to pay the bill. We had the 15 field artillery in Vancouver used to go up to the Coquihalla and use their artillery batteries to do the gap launch. It is now a civilian contract of engineers going out there using explosives and helicopters because it's cheaper for them to pay them than it is to pay for the military. So their training now for their artillery guys is gone. They've now lost out on it. Now they have to wait until we can go down to the States or ship them to Alberta to do their artillery because they have nowhere local for them to be doing their training. But mayors do not like the optics of the Army coming in the middle of a snowstorm in Florida. We but you were saying that the that snowstorm was in the sun. Go back. The ice storm that we had there. Yeah, and we, they, they didn't like the optics of what I'm saying. But, but you're saying that this is a great opportunity um, to, to keep the men and women in the uniform uh, trained and using the skills that, um, that could be developed. Yeah. And the issue is, is the public eye sees the military, they think it's bad. It's the same thing as seeing civilian police now carrying assault rifles because the security levels come up. You, you just got to adjust to it. That's what the world is now. Right. Any other thoughts on this one related to um, the uh, support of the um, civilian? Uh, Sorry, one other comment. So there's been a lot of talk about increasing export traffic from natural resources from BC. Um, I think that just heightens the importance of having resources to the support the Coast Guard to support civilian uh, resources. Uh, it's the idea in that case that a tanker gets in trouble, that right. we can deal with it effectively before yes. we have a crisis. Okay. The other thing about the tankers getting into trouble, you know, what came out just a, a week or so ago, uh, Shell Canada quits with the speed Arctic site, the decision celebrated. We're moving towards sustainable energy production as personified by the people of the Northwest Territories where they're capture sunshine to replace diesel generators and tractor tourists. To defend our north, we don't need PF-18 replacements. We need patrol ships and drones to detect any activity that may be of a nefarious nature. Russia is probably rethinking its own take on drilling in the north. That's why they want to be in the north. They want it there for what's under the water. Um, I don't know. I, I think there's a huge sea change. And as much as I love my grandson, who spent, uh, you know, deployed when they uh, decorated for his service in Afghanistan, and who I'm very proud of, there is a huge sea change going on, and we have to respect it. And to my mind, what we are doing uh, by taking away our bombing missions and putting in our, our soldiers who are wonderful trainers, including my grandson, uh, in, into, into that position in uh, Syria and Iraq, that's where we belong. And that doesn't, I don't think that we need these big uh, bombers. What the hell are we going to bomb? We're killing our planet as it is. We don't need to bomb it anymore. Well, the, you know, you, you jumped ahead a question on me, but let's uh, let's go there. So uh, the, the piece that we'll go to now is simply um, looking at what role the armed forces should um, play in support of peace operations internationally, you just say so and um, right? or you know the idea of helping conflict before it arises, helping prevent conflict before it arises, or do we do more of a you know get in there and do the the bombing? So does anybody have any thoughts on on the international piece? Uh, and we've talked. We've, Touch on it a little bit, but does anybody else have any further uh, thoughts that you want to add on? I want to hear from piece. the other fifty percent. Come on, this is twenty sixteen. <laughs> I'm carrying the can for the women. Okay. Well, we'll share it. If anybody has any thoughts, <laughs> sir, we need to step it up in regards of both sides. Okay. So on the the peacekeeping well and the response to the related side. Can I jump in? Just wait. Just wait. Yeah. Okay. Get it's, your turn. Yeah. It's pretty sad that after what happened in France when they had their terrorist attacks. There was a coalition meeting, and Canada wasn't even invited. That there is a huge disrespect for the troops that we have in our own country. That how are we not even involved in a NATO meeting for a coalition for the attack against ISIS? And it's okay. just their yeah, wait, no, manner in no, which they're treating the refugees. <laughs> and further to that, there was a time when our peacekeepers were the most um, Respect. in the whole world. 
our, uh, one, my husband was a peacekeeper, went to Egypt, spent a year there. We, we used to have a proud uh, armed forces in the peacekeeping we role. Know. And now we're becoming a joke. And we can't be sending our troops to, I know people that have done like three and four terms in Bosnia or Afghanistan. We can't be doing that. We only have 68,000 regular forces. If we want to send them to all these places, we need to increase the number. Okay. It's not fair to these young men to go four times to watch people being killed and then they come back and then their pensions get cut. Right. It, it's not fair. Okay. We need to bring back our honor. Okay. Sir, you had uh, a comment? No, I think we'll go, ahead. go here and then we'll give you your turn. So, so personally, I think the increased peacekeeping by Canada makes all Canadians safer in the world, that it, it builds our credibility and respect. Um, I also think it is a unique contribution that we can provide to our allies as well. Um, some of the ones that are more actively like, involved and entangled in some of these situations, I think they, would, they wouldn't be able to be peacekeepers the way I think Canada could be. So, so I think we, we can help ourselves, we can help the people who need help, and we can also do a good service for our allies. Okay. Sir, you had a comment. As you say, the peacekeeping conditions are not existent right now, since the last two years, five years, because usually you have a belligerent party, three or four, you go to a peace conference, you have a peace treaty or some sort of agreement signed on, then you have a peacekeeping operation type of situation. Today, you have ISIS, you have Boko Haram, you have uh, uh, the Philippines, you have uh, 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 whatever they call them, uh, Abu Sayyaf, and then all this ISIS, and then all these splinter group, all from 9-11. 9-11 started, and now they are expanding. It's not stopping. We, our war on terror is failing. Terribly, and our men in uniform are dedicated volunteer. They didn't. We didn't ask them. What they did. They, they themselves asked them to do. Even though some people coming back, they they out get out of the army, and they still think they would volunteer to join the fight to press murder. Some other colonel, the uh, uh, corporal, uh, neutral, or whatever John names. You look at the internet. And then the situation, that's why our foreign policy is so tied to U.S. we soon be. Okay. Well, but you want to say a good transition into... We, we should have, even though it's not your area, this uh, question uh, uh, beyond. Beyond is our foreign minister. So it should be more appropriate. Now we have a Jap Chinese diplomat or whatever. This place, our... It's a disregard. We don't have any respect. But we're, we're straying so, into a different area. So, so that's why we have stop. to beef out our own forces, put money into our research and development, build our own ships, build our own planes, yeah. instead of rely on somebody else. Look, you look at Singapore. You know, you know, I'm going to stop Singapore. you there. We're going to move. Well, let me finish. No, no, no. Let me, no you I can't can, cut me yes, off. Yes, I can. I'm facilitating, and we need okay, to so everybody. I have a whole list of questions here. You've okay. had your minute. Okay, so I'm going to stop you now. You will have other opportunities to speak. Thank so you. So that's why you so, have to reform the system. Thank you. Okay, I appreciate that. Now the piece that we skipped was on the North American piece. We heard a little bit about the Canadian-American piece. I heard somebody say that we need to hold our um, own you know, when working with the Americans or carry our weight. Is that generally the agreement on the, the North American piece? Or do we feel we could play a um, pull back a bit on North American defense? Or do we feel we have the right mix at this point on, uh, on, on uh, our role with NORAD? Anybody have any uh, strong feelings that way? Sorry, I didn't uh, Did you have? Um, I'm sorry, I just said I wish I knew what. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's an area I would say I'm not well versed in. I don't know if any of our. Um, well, that's the, that's the thing about uh, our Prime Minister Craig Chan said, no, we are not going into Iraq. And everybody now, how many years later, knows that that was the right decision. Okay, but Karen, we're nothing, talking, specific, this question is on North America. Yeah. And so, so now. So now the, now the Americans are whining away because we're not, uh, we're not carrying the load that they think we should. Uh, and 
we are more involved in peace and harmony in this country, and the country south of us is not. So they shouldn't be carrying us into their uh, military, industrial military complex that is churning out all these guns and starting all these wars, as, I'm, as far as I'm concerned. Okay, thank you, and we'll jump over here, and then I'm going to move on to the next area. Um, when I was serving, I was working in NORAD, which is uh, the binational contingent, so it's Americans and Canadians. Um, so I work hand in hand with, you know, use of uh, personnel. Um, the level of respect between the two services, you know, has been fantastic. And I think that if push came to shove, the Americans would save our ass. And I don't think anybody can truly dispute that. Um, while I don't agree that, you know, they have this whole world peace mentality, and I don't think we should be dragged into all that, um, they're an incredibly important ally who share the continent with us. And if we don't continue to build that relationship in a positive manner, then, you know, really going to be hanging ourselves up to dry. Okay, so good point. I think we'll leave it at that in this part of the discussion. What I'm going to move into next is looking at our, our capabilities and, and the future. And so the first question gets into uh, some of the, the, the composition we talked about. So it's simply, should the size, structure, and composition of the armed forces change from what they are today? Um, you know, so we, we and if, I, if you want, I can throw it back up about, um, you know, we have the, um, the armed forces, the um, um, there's the Navy, the, um, the Army, and the Air Force. Um, are all three of those branches still equally important? Do we have the right mix as far as investment? Um, you know, does anybody have, you know, to me it's a, unless you've been in, I'm not sure how you would judge that, but if anybody has any thoughts, please, um, you know, let, let us know. We're trying to get a sense of, are, are we happy with, with you know, how, we, um, how we've structured the armed forces, and we feel like that is positioning us to meet the challenges of the country, and that our role uh, internationally is, is to play. Anybody who hasn't spoken yet that uh, wants to, uh, this is a chance to jump in, or um, any, any strong feelings one way or another? Well, we we're facing this. You didn't have your hand up. I'm going to oh. jump over here. <laughs> <laughs> I was waving them all the time. Sir. Um, well, I didn't personally feel the overburdened amount of work. Um, I know that my trade, which was uh, Aedas Tech 226, um, we were underborne by 650 staff. So according to what the government wanted, we were 650 personnel short in my trade directly. Now, I didn't personally feel that that was uh, an onerous thing to us. Uh, I didn't feel that we were at a tempo that we couldn't sustain. Um, but we certainly were underborne for what the ideal situation was. That's an interesting question. So one of that, was it a resourcing issue? That um, you know that there, there wasn't the, the budget to get up to the level, or was it a like what what why would you be under? I, I think that there's plus. a lot of detriments to getting people to sign up for the forces. Okay. I mean, you're putting your life on the line. Frankly, the pay is rubbish. Um, you know, uh, in a technical position, I made spec two, so spe uh, specialist pay two. So I, as a corporal, I made uh, over sixty five thousand, which is not too bad. And, uh, but on the civilian side, I could easily make 90 or 100. I've started my own business since getting out, and I, I make well in excess of that. So I think that it's, it's really you know, getting the right talent and being able to attract people. Because it, it's not a sexy job. You know, people don't want to, to go risk their life. And that, I think that's what it comes down to a lot of the times. When uh, Cisco, the tons of layoffs in Ottawa, um, we picked up probably 20% of our trade came directly from Cisco staff. So, you know, it all comes down to the economy and, and who's paying what. And, you know, a lot of times the, the military is a good backstop for people that don't have a good job opportunity elsewhere. But if it was increased, so it was a more lucrative job, I think that you could attract people. Yeah. Any other so, Go here and then. Uh, so, in terms of equipment, I think the lead time of procuring ships and guns is very low. So that's one of those things where if something happens and it does, it's two weeks that you know, we need to have for equipment. Uh, and I think the, the um, comment was on uh, the, the timeline for, for, for procurement, um, that it's, uh, it's a very a long process and that 
he's saying it's basically the need to like tighten five it up. Ten years you get yeah, exactly. And, and you know, sometimes two or three election cycles and changes of government and yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're going to. Um, uh, and as far as the retaining more people, I know people in the military in Shiloh, Manitoba young family, and they're having to go to the food bank because they, as privates and corporals, are not getting enough pay. They don't even bring them up above the poverty line. When I got married in 65, our pay was so bad that we didn't even have to pay income tax. We never <coughs> filled out an income tax. We didn't know what it was for the first 10 years because our pay was so low. And uh, one, one particular time they got a raise, and it ended up netting my husband five cents a month. It's like, how do you expect to recruit people when you, they can't make any money? Well, you know, and just so you know, there's a, a question of the will here. Wanting to see more on that, and I'd like to actually pick up this uh, thought that's being raised about the, the quality of life as a uh, at a uniform member. So, I'm uh, sorry, you had a comment. I think your question was, uh, do we agree with the makeup of the armed forces in Canada? Yeah, the size structure, so I, the composition. Yes. Uh, I, I don't know how any of us would be qualified to answer that question. However, <laughs> when you listen to what other people are saying, clearly our armed forces are not well equipped. Uh, and we've got uh, equipment that dates back to the 70s and 80s, and we've got uniforms that, that soldiers can't afford to, or can't fit into. So clearly what we're doing is taking what limited amount of money we have and stretching it too far. We should identify what it is we choose to do and then fully invest in that and make sure that we're the best we can be in that. So when you try, try to take already a skinny budget and spread it over a vast amount, you end up being nothing. So we should decide what we are going to be and invest in it. Be the best we can be with in that. It's interesting you say that to the session I was at previously where we were talking about infrastructure investment and the message that I heard was instead of building new stuff on top of things that are falling apart, let's deal with the stuff that's falling apart now and, and get that working and then we can look at, at new things. And I don't know if that actually, you know, but I, I'm getting that sense. It's like let's fix what we have from now, invest properly in it, um, make sure that we have the right equipment and uniforms, that we pay our men and women appropriately, and then we can look at, at um, new and different things. But, Let's get it right first. Is that no, fair? Well, essentially, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, okay. Well, except but, but we should also increase our, our investment because uh, clearly we haven't allocated enough to our own forces to begin with because we do have to play a major role. We are a major country in the world. We do have to play a major role in supporting our allies in whatever way we choose to do it. But when we do it, let's not send our young men and women in with antiquated equipment, which puts them at greater risk. Yeah, so. I, just, I thought you were asking if you thought we had the right mix of uh, army, air force, and navy. That, that's definitely part of it, if we feel that those are still relevant, but it was also that the size, the, you know, like, uh, do we have the right numbers to be growing, decreasing within those chains, those sizes. I don't know how we can know that. Well, I think that as Canadians, we tend to have opinions whether or not we're experts or not. And so, you know, I think that's, you know, because ultimately, if, if, um, if we get it, if we implement something and you don't agree with it, I would expect to hear from you. And so that's part of why we're asking the question now is that let's at least, you know, get lots of, of Canadians out there so that um, as we roll things out, um, hopefully we'll have agreement that we got it right. Those numbers there, I would like to know when the last time they were checked, because I can guarantee the numbers are already lower. It is dropping dramatically from how many members are stepping out of our military, and I don't think we have a military. Out Willie, of your order ready, Willie? At this time. It's very sneaky. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> 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 I'll have to sign the prize with that. <laughs> so I'm going to move into a, a slightly different area that we started to touch on, and, and the question here is, um, uh, where was it? How can the uh, Department of National Defense and the Canadian Armed Forces improve the way they support the health and wellness of military, mem uh, military members? In what areas should more be done? And so we've heard about level of pay, um, the, the equipment, and uh, um, you know, so that stuff. And this is where I'll jump in. Okay, please. <laughs> so, 
My name is Tracy Cromwell. I'm the executive director with the Military Family Resource Center uh, for mainland BC. So I represent approximately 2,000 families on the mainland as opposed to Vancouver Island. So my colleagues and I, there are MFRCs across the country. There's 31 of, 31 of them. We are all independent, uh, not-for-profit organizations. So we don't answer up through the chain of command of the military. I answer to my board of directors. But we do have kind of a loose uh, association as we come together. So we have meetings recently, and we decided that it was very important that we get that message out to Minister E. Uh, Sajjan that that families are very critical to the new defense policy. So I'll just read my very brief statement because there's a lot of people who put effort into this, and I don't want to deny them their effort to have their words heard. So we believe that when you strengthen families, you strengthen forces. Even though Canadian military families have been and continue to be directly impacted by their important contribution to the mission of the CAF, there is no mention of their contribution nor the place of military families in the 1994 defense white paper nor in the 2013 document Canada First. Canadian military families must be recognized in the new defense policy as an integral element of the Canadian Armed Forces. Families make significant contributions to operational effectiveness and therefore must be supported by all levels of government throughout the military, fam sorry, through the military family resources centers which are governed by families for families. Thank you. I think that's a, a piece you know, we've heard about um, um, our men and women coming back and suffering from things like PTSD and having treatment for them, but not for the families. And and um, you know I, I think that there's a very real need to uh, involve families in, in the full range of issues. Uh, you know, suicide I, watch. Yeah, very, exactly. Karen said suicide watch. Um, so uh, yeah, I appreciate that. Anybody else have any thoughts on? We'll jump over here I first. Can, and I can touch base on that mental health thing. Um, we are short doctors for mental health, but it is increasing. They are definitely improving that. Um, the biggest concern is education with it, but recognizing it to be able to support your fellow comrade that's actually suffering. The issue is, is that people don't report it, or the person who is suffering themselves doesn't want the help because they don't want to lose the benefits of the military. They feel that they're going to get kicked out. That's the issue right now that's causing it, and it's keeping people so they actually don't expose that they have an illness because they don't want to lose their position. They don't want to be treated differently, and so they hide it. And that's why we've been having so such high climb of suicides after Afghanistan, is people are hiding this stuff in and they're taking so much toll on themselves, it's affecting them in the long term. So that's one of our biggest concerns with mental health is just the education of it. Thank you. Well, I was just going to say that I think, uh, is there a program to support, to sort of help families prepare for the return of the person that's coming back from the field? Because yes, there is. There is. Well, and, and, and are those programs adequate? Is there more that could be done, or, or are they? We are concerned that there is no mention of families in the defense policy. So. So we would like to see it get in there just to kind of uh, stabilize. So in, in terms of how the funding for the military, the military family resource centers are funded, as not-for-profit organizations, we apply for grants, we do fundraising like any other charitable organization would do. We do apply for some funding through the Department of National Defense, but I write my grant proposal, they review it. It comes through the Department of National Defense through military family services. That's how I get some of my funding. So we need to make sure that if some of that funding is coming through the Department of National Defense, we would like families mentioned there to make sure that some of that funding stays stable so that that funding comes to us. So yes, there is funding available. It is variable. It's not guaranteed because we have no mention in there. So we want to firm up that relationship. We want to firm up that. Uh, also, as this gentleman mentioned, there's more and more people that we're seeing the same way that maybe the members aren't going and doing that, the families are definitely coming up. And so a lot of families too, they are the ones who are living with the members with PTSD. They are the ones who are supporting them. They are the ones that are moving around with them. They are the ones doing that. So um, looking for that. And we've also, I heard somebody mention veterans earlier. 
uh, VAC has recently funded a pilot program with Military Family Services, of which then we can access some money for some of the families of medically releasing veterans. So we're also seeing a big shift in that too, and we're saying, okay, that's fine. We would love to be able to help those families as well, but you need to watch your funding if that's what you're going to do, because that all of a sudden opens up. I go from 2,000 active families to I don't even know how many veteran families there are in, in mainland BC. So all of a sudden that's expanding too. So we're not so much looking for give me, give me, give me. It's just like, no, please recognize this so that we're part of these decisions as they go forward. Sir. Uh, I'd just like to address the issue because it affects, we're talking about families right now, right? So um, we, the, the Liberal government needs to uh, reinstate the pensions for wounded veterans as they promised they would in their election campaign. So that's something that should actually happen right here. So, and then that should extend forward to families of veterans and wounded veterans because they are the ones who have to dedicate their lives. In many cases, they have to give up their lives in order to support the wounded veteran. So uh, wives or spouses uh, have to uh, give up their own careers in order to be able to support the, the men and women that come back uh, wounded. So I think that they, the, um, any policies that we have need to extend forward to the family because it's not just the veterans or the uh, soldiers that are giving up things in their lives in order to support the Canadian uh, public. But the families that support them are also having to give up things in their lives. Absolutely. Thank you. Sir. Um, similar along the, the lines of pensions, not necessarily about uh, veterans specifically, but you know, when I joined it, you had to do 20 years to, to get a pension, and then to return a contribution was anything short of a medical discharge. Now it's 25 years. Well. Anybody who served 20 years is a long time. 25 is stretching it even more. And I think that was a disservice to everybody. Okay. Sure, we need to make sure we know that. Um, yeah, these are, are useful comments that I'll pass on to both departments, so we can here and uh, Veterans Cares Canada as well. Um, Karen, you're going to make a comment. Well, John, if I could, um, I was a policy chair for 20 years and I drafted this policy which speaks to this. Whereas the Royal Canadian regions are located in 163 BC communities, 1,431 nationwide, and 10 in the USA and Europe. Whereas the Royal Canadian region serves Canada's military as well as its RCMP and peace officers. And whereas the Royal Canadian region is seeking renewal. And whereas veterans are comfortable in the company of their peers when talking about their war experiences and or post-traumatic stress disorder. Therefore, be it resolved that the Government of Canada takes steps to modernize this historic movement dating back to 1917 through funding of outsourcing of services such as gyms and pools, like through the YM, YWCA, coffee shops like Tim Hortons that was in, in uh, Afghanistan, nightclubs, lay counseling, and such other activities that would update the work of the Legion and enhance its culture through federal government support. And that was passed by, by this riding association. Any other comments on, on families? Um, or, uh, I still have a couple more questions and we're uh, running uh, near the end of our time. So if there's nothing else to I'll jump in there, um, I'd like to get your thoughts on um, investments in sort of other areas, this idea of, of um, cyber, cyber investments um, to look at security, uh, to look at you know, space, the idea of you know, should we be uh, defending ourselves because there is a space piece that we, uh, we should be uh, considering. Um, and, and the other one that I, I think would be really useful to hear about is the um, idea of unmanned systems. And you know, there's some controversy about you know, the use of drones um, for both um, uh, intelligence gathering, but also for, for armed uh, combat. Um, so any thoughts on those areas? So the, the cyber space and unmanned, you know, are those areas that we'd like to see investments made in? Um, and again, realizing that either resources come from somewhere else or we put more resources in. Well, the fact of the matter is we are in a technology 
yeah. happy world now. And if we don't invest in cyber technology in our armed forces, we might as well pack up and go home. I mean, you know somebody else is. It's so redundant. I mean, we would be redundant if we didn't. We have to. Okay. Talk about cyber. Yeah. Calgary City uh, University just paid hacker twenty thousand dollars because they don't have any capacity to immediately resolve that problem. Now it's maybe open up a can of worms that we have no control of. Though, so as you say, where the resources we should put in, definitely in our main man level have to go up about ten percent, maybe three percent. Whatever take how long five years six years, and resources going to s more stringent control of cyber uh, surveillance. Where, where we have already C C fifty one Bill C on the security issue, or we in charm on some of our basic right. We have to give up some to insult in order to protect us. Are we truly in that? Are we have oversight? Two though haven't been changed yet. Right. I, I heard your government should be more. This discussion should be an hour more. It's our two and a half hour and a half. This is not acceptable. You still, to me, you are building it. it's, it, Instead of everything so like tramping from the from the bill of uh, assisted suicide, or, or and, and then you have the bill of uh, 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 electoral reform. Why is so crammed into a time frame? In the past 15 years, we haven't done anything. Why suddenly so rush? Are we in the Obama situation on Medicare? No, I, I can tell Are you we in the Obama situation on Medicare like down there? We don't have, also, our healthcare is also not funded properly. Yeah. Of course, that's another I'll, issue. I'll take a, a but, quick but moment to I can uh, tell to you some of which area we should put. Look at the chart. Mm -hmm. yeah, we have a C-17. Not enough. Hey, pal. Oh. I want to hear what so, John's answer is. Well, so, look at the chat. That's the. No, what I was going to say is simply that we uh, went into the. Uh, we were elected on a very aggressive agenda um, for change. And so, um, and some of it is driven by us, so electoral reform. We said that uh, the last election would be the final one uh, under the first past the post. And so, we're, we've committed to um, studying and coming up with a new system. Um, within a four-year period. But can we do it in two years? In well, that's what we're working years? on. Uh, Three years? Yeah, two and a half years? C-14, so uh, the assisted dying one, is simply there was a court-imposed deadline, and uh, we're trying to meet that. Um, so you know, that's why we're uh, we're pushing, and, and but we're also taking time to step back where we need to, and that's why instead of rushing into this one and making decisions, um, we're saying let's take some time, go out and talk to Canadians and figure out on, on issues like um, the future of our, uh, our armed forces. Um, Let's talk to Canadians. So, yes, sir. So, I was going to comment that in the United States, they, they do actually do quite a bit of research funding, including things that have commercial and business applications. So, there's DARPA grants and there's SBIR grants, and all the major U.S. government agencies have them, including NASA and grants. So, so, things that are new technologies, startup companies, there, there's ways to, to get funding for things. And it's, it's related to the mission and the things that the military or NASA is interested in doing, so it's not completely you know, just random stuff. So, so I think that maybe there's an opportunity to, to look at things, if there's uh, green energy or if there might be things that make sense that are applicable to our military, uh, where, where there's research that will benefit all Canadians and uh, our military as well to be able to, to do research. Okay, so yeah, that, that's a piece that haven't come up in any of this is that the research, uh, the investment in research. So, um, great point. You're going to make a comment. Yeah, um, you were talking about satellites and things like that over the war. Um, so, twice a year, the, the military staff between CFS Alert and Weather Station Eureka uh, replaced batteries on about 10 or 12 different microwave mix sites that go between Eureka and CFS alert. So this is a huge undertaking that has lots of personnel, and literally they're going in swapping a giant battery to uh, pass out. And that's the solution to get towns up to the North Pole for, for our service. Community. But uh, I mean, I would like to know what the, the cost of that is twice a year, 
and, and see you know, what the, the cost of running a satellite is. Now, satellites are millions of dollars a year, but you know, up in alert, because of the lack of satellite signal, we're constantly on uh, sat phones, which run $35 a minute, something like that. So, you know, there's a lot of extended costs just for maintaining CFS alert. And I, I would never say uh, remove that station, but um, I think there's definitely some cost improvements that could be done uh, associated with it. Okay, yeah. Great insight, thank you. Any other thoughts on that? Well, I think the uh, space program needs to be celebrated more because that's when you do bring Russia together, and you do bring, and they live together and work together, and uh, there's no there's no discussion about war when that when that's uh, being undertaken, and there's so many things that Canada is good at. Our telecommunication company that built across northern Canada, we also built the uh, communications system for Saudi Arabia. That was right out of Langley, and that was with um, Aramco. And those sorts of things that the Americans love us for our space arm, they love us for our technology. You know, they love, what about China? They're, they're building a, a nuclear power stations there with our technology and our engineers. We have to celebrate those things. We don't have to think that we're uh, some, you know, a lesser, a lesser nation. Just because we are small, we're when not When you keep referring to the communications, like are you referring to Duline type stuff? Is well, this, this will be the latest iteration of sure. D-Line. This is what brought telephone and telecommunications to the north. LeBlanc and Royal Telecommunications Company. Lover Road. Lineman City. I'm just um, putting up uh, the um, link for the uh, consultations if anything um, comes to mind. So. Don't be distracted by that. I have one last question in the about 10 minutes. And sir, I, I accept your point that it would be nice to have more time. Uh, and, and it wasn't that we don't want to hear from Canadians. I thought on a Friday afternoon, 90 minutes is probably a reasonable amount of time to ask for people. Um, but uh, I'm more than happy to meet with anybody if you have additional thoughts. Or like I say, there are um, opportunities to go online and give other thoughts. And uh, there's a chance tomorrow to give more thought. Uh, the better part of the day is available. Um, the last question I have simply is, is there anything else that we didn't talk about uh, as you know, in the context of Canada's um, armed forces moving forward that you feel you'd like to get on record that you'd like me to pass on to, um, to Minister uh, Sajjan and, uh, and my colleagues in the House of Commons? Oh, I just have a letter. Uh, in my personal opinion, I think one of the biggest things that we need to be pushing for as Canadians and as well as the Department of National Defense is to be pushing to be reinstating the bill of the Afghanistan memorial because they have now ceased that and shelved it. When the Conservative government was trying to push it to get it done, they had it cited, they had a budget cut for it. As soon as Trudeau's government came in, they stopped it all And it's now been shelved. So the uh, 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 memorial uh, that they're, building, they're supposed to be building in Ottawa. In Ottawa. And it stopped? They yeah. stopped it. Yeah. They stopped three projects with it. There's the Victoria Cross Recipients Memorial, the Afghanistan Memorial, and also they've got a, they had a program for uh, revitalizations of cenotaphs across Canada that the government were supporting has now ceased. Because no, well, they, that, there's well, actually funding for that one. Is it still going? Yeah. Because they said that they, if they didn't, the Trudeau government did not reinstate the, uh, or at least restart the program again, it was going to stop at the end of March. Yeah, no, that one uh, has been continued. Has it been continued? Yeah, because I was just, uh, there's a, it, it's lumped in with some other things, but, um, um, I don't know if I have it um, here, but uh, no, it's definitely there that uh, communities wanting to um, invest in cenotaphs um, and, uh, and war memorials in the communities can do that. Okay, so that is just basically for the two then, the yeah. memorial for Afghanistan and also the Victoria Cross recipients. Right. Yeah, Victoria Cross recipients, I, I'm not sure the background they're, on they're that kind one. They're kind of both the same. They, okay. Together, yeah. okay. I think there should be some recognition of Afghanistan being extremely rich in um, in rare minerals that are used in our laptops and our phones, they could they could be extremely wealthy country. It's a you know they could have they could use their poppy crops to make morphine, which is in dire need in uh, in emerging countries. There are so many things about the countries that we become involved in that, given some sort of economic 
um, <coughs> Jews that they could they could be very much well on their way to my my grandson joined because he said Granny you're a feminist I'm going over there because of the women what they're doing to women they're hanging them from the soccer pole soccer and uh, and he came back saying you know there's so much to that country that they're not making use of. Never yeah, I know. well, and that's, that's, that's. If, it, if we were still in the 70s well, and 80s, most definitely, they would definitely yeah. have become a third, like a first world country yeah. if they chose to. Yeah. But since they went back into the Sharia and the law, mm -hmm. yeah. they've now put themselves back into, yeah. Yeah. Well, like a hundred years back now, yeah. and, and they're now stuck yeah. there yeah. until they but, reform. But that speaks to why soldiers aren't going back there either, because they're thinking, what am I doing over here, you know? So um, just to try and close things off, are there any other comments that anybody wanted to offer? I'm going to give you a last chance because I have a feeling we're going to be a little bit longer. Um, so uh, any other short and snappy ones? Um, this is very short and snappy. Yeah. That website has been down quite a bit. Oh, has it? Yeah. So you may, I don't know who that, I don't know where the IT link is to just yeah. let people know because we we've actually put that out to our members, and I'm just hoping that when they're going on, it's not. Yeah, there. Let's yeah. flag it to the mic. I wonder if there's yeah. periods yeah. where it's yeah. traffic yeah. or yeah. so. Yeah, we'll play that just out. Just Good to know. Marilyn, you have it. I was just going to say that I was raised in a family of conscientious objectors. I don't share that thought or anymore, but I can hardly go to a parade and watch the cadets march. And when I hear hear what happens to the people that do go and give their lives and, and that we're, we need to do more. We need to not send people to represent us, our country, without backing them up, having their back when they come back, when they come home. We have to do it right. I agree with that. To, to make sure Canadians <coughs> appreciate and respect and you know, kind of acknowledge and celebrate the contributions that our veterans and our service members are making. I feel like there, there could be more done there. Yeah, it often seems to be relegated to November 11th, and that's where we do our thank you, and then we forget the 364 days. And, and I completely agree, yeah, it should be um, something that is, is always there, absolutely. And I'd really like to see the Liberal government reinstate the pension for the returning vet that was mentioned earlier. My husband was in Korea, and he was wounded. He tripped off a landmine, broke one leg, put three holes in the other leg. And he got a lifetime pension. Some of these young boys coming back, and women, uh, young girls coming back from Afghanistan, and other places, they're giving a, um, a, a lump sum payment and expecting them to go on, um, go back to civilian life, get a career, and make a go of things. And they can't do that. We've and got, the lump yeah. sum they're giving them is so inadequate. We, we do have a bill that's going through the House now to look at um, revisiting the new veterans charter that deals with that. Um, but, you know, and it's been, there's been some very positive comments. It sounds like there's some improvements that can be made on it that we're, we'll hear at the committee stage. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I agree, and we've heard that that is an issue, and we're, we're attempting to, uh, to fix it. Um, when my husband was in Korea, he was, under, he was in a forward observation post, so he was in front of the front line. When he saw the gunfire from the Chinese, he <coughs> timed it to see how far it Way it was. Um, they were at one point for 14 days and nights under continual bombardment from the Chinese. And when he heard that the uh, government was rewriting the Veterans Charter and that the vets would not, these young vets wouldn't get a lifetime pension, he said he'd like to see each and every one of the members of Parliament for 14 days having a cannon and rifle fire and then see what their attitude would be. Yeah. 
that they have no idea what these people are going through. These people are willing to give their lives and then the government takes their pension away. Yeah. I, I hear you. You know, the other thing, I wonder if I could check it with you guys, is when my grandson goes to um, Overdale High School, where he was raised and went to school, they called it Remembered Day in his honor. And each year he went there and he quit because he said, all these kids stood around and said, so how many cowies did you kill? How many cowies did you kill? That's all they wanted to, they, all they wanted to know was like the war games, like the videos. How many guys did you kill? Oh, come on, tell us, Mitch, what happened? You know, how come, what did you do to get the bravery award? He's not telling anybody what he did to get the bravery award. You know, and that's the trouble with the conflict between video games, war games, and movies, and the real yeah. thing. And that's the bravery. It all depends on how you bring it across and depending on who you're speaking with it of it. Um, it's more of teaching kids respect and not letting them get away with everything. Absolutely. And being soft served everything on a silver platter. And you need to be taught what's right, what's wrong, and know the difference. Our gen the generation that's yeah, coming up behind us right now. Over that. We're I'm in just trouble. saying that for the one day of the year when he was giving of it himself, that's what he came up again. And, um, that's maybe what's out there. Okay, just before we go to the final comment, um, Jennifer, did you have any questions? You've been very well, quiet. I'm just waiting to direct them to get their names. Oh, okay. It's been a very interesting discussion. Thank you very much for having us. Yeah, so for, close to my office. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. For a local reporter, and uh, yeah, so always a pleasure to see you. Anybody else have any uh, last minute uh, comments? Otherwise, um, as I said, uh, I'll give you the last, uh, the last uh, two feet. Oh, wait, you're pushing it. It's not a pop area. Okay. But uh, no, I just, before I do that, I just wanted to thank everybody because not everybody might be able to stay. We're up at that time where we said we would end. So if everybody needs to go, we can stay and chat. And um, uh, for myself and Minister um, Sajjan, um, thank you so much for coming out. And like I say, this is the website. Um, if you do uh, have other thoughts, please go. There's material there. So if you'd like to do a bit more uh, reading on, on what we've talked about today and, uh, and then offer some additional thoughts, do that. Um, uh, we're trying to wrap this up by the end of July, so there, but there's still um, over a month to uh, to continue feeding into this review. Any and opportunity and, well, you know, we, we need to move forward at some point into the census. Let's get out there. And let's. Well, this is this is the main kick at it to get Canadians engaged and giving us their thoughts. So, thank you so much. Okay, uh, before you leave, please look at the sign. I know get in, but these are new. We are not, that's the uh, assumption. So, um, uh, so to bring it up, the forces, we can use some of the